Hello and welcome to the Year 7 Parents Information Presentation. Usually I'd be doing this presentation in the main hall, uh, but this year with the restrictions in place, I hope this video presentation will be a reasonable second place. The aims of this session are to share with you how we set performance targets for students as they go through the college, how we look at their current performance, how teachers assess students' work, and how we then communicate all of that information to parents. My name is Mr Richards, I'm the Vice Principal at the College. I have responsibility for things like the timetable for the curriculum, for options, processes as students move through to GCSEs, as well as the performance data, uh, target setting and looking at tracking pupil performance as they go through the College. Now this graphic shows you um, a change that happened a few years ago now. On the right hand side you've got some GCSE grades. Now they were in place when I was at school many years ago, the old A star to G where C represented a pass mark. That changed recently um, and the grading goes from 1 as the lowest grade through to grade 9 as the highest grade. Uh, a grade 4 is now considered to be what's called a standard pass and a grade 5 is what we now call a, a strong pass or sometimes a good pass. Um, the government's ambition is for people to pass at grade five um, and the grade four is the point at which students then uh, are considered to have passed especially maths and English and don't need to continue with maths and English GCSEs after year 11 so really the new the new C is is a bit like the uh, a four I know it seems a long way off, but in maths and English, in order to progress to level three courses after students are 16, then a grade four is is, is, is considered that um, a pass rate at which you don't need to continue that subject. But for many A-level subjects, you need at least a strong pass, uh, if not a higher than a strong pass, a, a six or a seven, to be really successful at A-level. So that just gives you an indication of, of what those grades mean in terms of uh, the future for students. So we come on to how do we set performance targets? Um, it is, I think, important for students to have a clear sense of what represents good performance and good progress for them and for parents to know really uh, in a simpler way as possible, are they making the, the progress that they should be making and, and doing as well as they could? Um, and that's really the aim of target setting is is not really to create a, a ceiling or a maximum or in any way to be demotivating, but just to, to give everyone an indication of what um, what good performance looks like. In order to set targets, uh, we don't create them ourselves. We, like many or almost all secondary schools that I'm aware of locally and nationally, we use a, a charitable organisation who specialise in educational data. The FFT stands for Fisher's, a Fisher Family Trust uh, and their specialism is looking at performance, uh, and then generating some targets for students as they mo move through secondary school. And I'm a big fan of uh, FFT. I think it's a really good organisation. They do have a real mission to overcome uh, social disadvantage and to make sure that educational data makes sense and works for teachers and for parents. It's a non-governmental organisation, so it's not affiliated with the government. Um, it is an independent charity, which um, it does have a real sense of social mission. So. Um, it is something which I think is a, is a powerful tool for professionals and parents alike. And what FFT allows you to do is to look at students' performance at the end of primary school, so based on Key Stage 2 SATs, and it allows you to project forward to the end of Year 11 for that student. So you can see that last year's Year 7, who will be graduating in Year 11 in 2023, um, we we're able to click on that group of students, see what they achieved in primary school, and then the data system allows us to see based on similar students over the last three or four years, what does good progress look like for that student? What, what would represent something which was a good level of success uh, for students of a similar starting point? 
And this graphic just shows you what information we receive. So you can see at the top where the arrow is pointing to key stage two score. Uh, we get a score for reading and for maths from primary schools. And then based on that information, the system looks at millions of, of students over the last um, good few years. And then anyone with that profile with 120 in reading and 109 in maths, it then tells us what the average outcome for that student is. And for the student who um, I've selected here and, and I've anonymized, you can see that for art and design, students with that similar previous academic profile tend to get a grade seven in art and design, a seven plus in biology and a seven in business studies. Now, of course, all students are different. They're all individuals and there'll be a, a wide range of outcomes for students with that same ability. But that just shows us that um, that's the average outcome, the most um, normal outcome for those types of students. But of course, we're not really aiming for average. We're not intending the students at the end of year 11 to get to average. We want them to be above average, and so there's another step in the process. So as I say, normally we would have key stage two test results for um, mathematics and reading. They are between 80 and 120, and we use those combination of those scores to work out what the average student, the average similar student would get at the end of year 11. However, this year, with the lockdown and disruption to key stage two SATs at the end of year six, students didn't sit assessments in reading and maths. What we decided to do is um, employ a system called GL assessment. Uh, and you'll be aware that your son or daughter has recently sat an online series of, of tests, which are designed to give us a sense of their kind of cognitive uh, ability. Now, we then input that information into our FFT system, and that tells us where those students should be at the end of year 11 um, for students with similar uh, cognitive uh, abilities. So the system looks almost the same, um, comparing the year before uh, with Key Stage 2 scores to this year where we've just used GL assessment. But what we can do, here is that same student mentioned previously with the 120 and 109 as their scores. I mentioned that we're not aiming for average scores for our students. We can set a level of challenge for them. And we could set high or very high. And what we've discovered is there's not a huge difference between the two. So what we do is we use the 20th centile. So students with a similar starting point, the same scores in reading and maths, what the top 20% of students with similar starting points would achieve. And really nationally that's recognized as good performance. If they meet that um, top 20% ambition by the end of year 11, they're considered to have done very well. Now here's a different student, but it's just showing you the difference between average progress so this student got 115 and 116 average for that student is a grade seven by the end of year 11 but when we increase the challenge to for that student to reach the top 20 percent of similar students then their target increases to an eight so you can see that there's challenge built into those targets uh, from the very beginning and what we find is that the targets for, and this, these are targets for the art, biology, and business for a single student, they're actually very similar. So students do on the whole come out with quite similar grades across all of their subjects on, an, on a national level. Um, GCSEs are organized so that the difficulty of each GCSE is roughly equivalent. It's, it's not quite like that, but essentially, they're required to get a similar target at the end of each of their subjects. So as I've shown you, FFT allows us to look at two pieces of information, where students were at the end of primary school, or in this case, where they are in year seven for their assessments, and where they should be by the end of year 11 if they are to make good progress. However, year 11 is a long way off. 
if we were to always compare current performance, so your child's performance six weeks into year seven, with their target for the end of year 11, there's an enormous gap of five years between those two things. So what we do to try and um, deal with that issue is to set an end of year target. So we, we work back in stages from their year 11 target at the end to show where students should be at the end of each of the years. So the end of seven, eight, nine, and then we give them a, an end of key stage target for 10 and 11. And this is what those trajectories look like. So where it says end of year 11 in the right hand column, you've got targets ranging from three minus up to grade nine, according to the prior attainment of the students. But then you can see for uh, a student who has, let's take five minus as the end of year 11 target, we can work back from that. And so by the end of year seven, we'd be looking at a grade three as their end of year target, if they are to be on track to reach that five by the end of year 11. By the end of year eight, it's three plus, four, four plus, and then five minus to reach that end point. And this is what we call our flight path. So for this student, this is an example of a student who has a grade six target at the end of year 11, according to FFT. And that's their flight path. So from four minus in year seven up to six minus in year 11. And we would expect students really to make roughly two sub levels of progress per year. So it's not a whole grade per year. Um, and I'll go on to explain what a sub level is. And don't forget that we have three data captures in a normal year and Students do make progress throughout the year. The targets are end of year. So each of the reports that we give to parents, the amount of distance they need to make up by the end of the year changes slightly. So when we put in our first data at data capture one, if you are two sub levels away from your end of year target, then that, that's considered to be fine. By the time you get to the second data capture, which is usually mid year, then you need to be around one sub-level away from your target. And by the end of the year, that target should be achieved. And if it has been achieved by the end of the year, then you are on, tra on track to make good progress. And here's what I mean by a sub-level. So the minuses and pluses here represent a sub-level. So between a two minus, there are two sub-levels. So the two minus goes to a grade two, and the two goes to a two plus, and the difference between a minus, a two, and a two plus uh, is a sublevel. So that shows you the amount of progress that probably the average student might make across one year in order to stay uh, on track to meet those ambitious targets. So we generate targets for students for the end of year 11. We then create a flight path of end of year targets, which are checkpoints along the way. Teachers assess students' work, and we put that information into our information management system, which then creates information for parents. Hopefully you've had uh, a chance to download EduLink, which is how we communicate to parents. Now, when the data is ready for uh, parents to see, there will be an email to parents with a link. And when you get into EduLink, there is a button, as I've indicated on this slide, called Assessment. You click on the Assessment button, and that will take you to the assessment information for your son or daughter. The first time teachers are asked to put in information about Year 7 students is on the 9th of November, so very shortly. We call this settling in data. Um, and really, this is, it's not our first uh, analysis of students' academic performance. They're given simply a score between one and four, one being the best, four being the lowest, for the quality of their classwork and homework, and also behavior for learning, which includes all things like effort, application in class, uh, degree of focus, as well as uh, any distracting behaviors and so forth.
We'll publish this information on the 16th of November via Edgelink and that will look quite different to others that won't have targets on, that won't have current performance grades on. The reason for that is because um, we've had about eight or nine weeks in school and some subjects have one, possibly two lessons. So not every subject has had the opportunity to assess work formally. And also the targets have only just been released by uh, FFT. So in January, you'll get a normal assessment. And I'll show you an example of that in just a moment. In that assessment, you will see targets, you will see current performance. There will be a comparison of those two things. So you can see how students are progressing academically. But this first set of data is just about how they're settling in, um, whether they are doing the right things to be making progress early uh, in their time at Uplands. And when you click on the assessment button of EduLink, you should see something like this. The one in November will look slightly different to this, but after November in January and throughout their school career, this is what the report will look like for students. It will have a good progress indicator, which is that um, score for the end of the year, which represents what good progress looks like for your son or daughter. You'll also have a current performance grade and there's colour coding just to indicate whether the student is meeting or surpassing their good progress indicator or where there is a, a degree of, of concern, for example. So. Here we can see that uh, in art, a good progress indicator is a one plus and they're currently performing at a two minus, which means they're above where they should be in order to make good progress. So they're making really good progress, which is really good news. Maths is an interesting example here. Maths is not quite uh, where it should be and therefore it's color coded orange for slight concern. This was from the first data capture and so this student is three sub levels. So it would be a three to a three plus, three plus to a four minus and four minus to a four, which is where we get our three sub levels from. There is some concern over the progress there. Um, we would expect, as I've said earlier, two sub levels of progress throughout this year. But this student is three sub levels away. So there's a slight concern. If they were more than three sub levels away, then the color coding would go to red. And that's where there does need to be a, a detailed conversation about what can be done to help um, students make additional progress. We also have the same information, but in a more printable format. Uh, it's under the documents section in EduLink. It tells you the same thing, uh, but it just presents it as a PDF, which can be printed uh, if that's helpful. It's the same uh, information. You can see one minus and one plus and an effort score. Uh, all the same information, but without the color coding. One question I'm frequently asked is why there are different targets for the end of year seven for different subjects. And they do in year seven look fairly low, some targets. You can see for this student that even though their end point in year 11 would be the same, they would have perhaps a, a grade four target for all of their subjects. Maths and Spanish have different targets for the end of year seven, so different indicators for good progress for the end of the year. Now, I'll go on to explain why that is on the next slides. And that's because we have three different types of trajectories. The big number seven on this slide represents the end of year 11 target. So we've seen a student who has this, they have a grade seven target in biology, in art, in English, in maths, and all sorts of different things. But the route to get to that seven is different for different subjects. The red line, which is a straight line and starts higher up, represents English, maths and the humanities. Now, in primary school, students do a lot of maths. They do a lot of English. They do a fair amount of humanities subjects. So they're not starting from zero. They're not. Uh, they come with some prior knowledge. Also, they have frequent lessons in those subjects at Uplands. Every um, every other day they'll have a maths lesson or English lesson and those are consistent throughout the whole of their education. So it's a fairly straight line trajectory. Uh, we would expect them to make steady you know, and regular progress throughout 7 to 11. 
Now the blue line is uh, slightly different and that's for subjects that perhaps have less coverage in primary school and fewer hours in Key Stage 3 at Uplands. So they come with a little less prior knowledge and that might be things like drama, might be art, it could be things like ICT which, which have differing levels of coverage at primary school. They also have fewer hours in Key Stage 3, so they have perhaps two hours a fortnight, whereas by the time they reach Key Stage 4, if they opt for that subject, then they've increased to five hours. So we can see that the rate of progress starts fairly uh, slowly, but increases as the hours increase in Key Stage 4. And the final line represents modern foreign languages. Again, the coverage is different at primary schools, but in some primary schools, there's almost no coverage of language at all. And they do come with um, fairly foundational skills in language. So they start much lower, which explains why Spanish and English have different targets for the end of year seven. They have fewer lessons than English and maths in MFL. as modern foreign languages in year seven. So the progress rate starts slower, but they are expected to reach a seven in all subjects by the end of um, year 11 and so the trajectory becomes much steeper as they reach key stage four now of course no students are <laughs> completely um, average and this is very much a kind of uh, an indication of what uh, an average student might achieve we know that normal students would not have a profile like this and would make excellent progress in some years slightly slower in others they might have periods um, of, of illness which mean they their, their progress slows for example but this just gives us a, a kind of broad brushstroke idea of what good progress will look like um, it's not intended to either be a ceiling or to be completely unachievable but it does just gives a, give us a starting point for any conversations about progress Uh, here you can see the subjects that are listed on those trajectories. So the reason that MFL, art, music, uh, drama targets look lower in, in Key Stage 3 is because of the reasons that I've just set out. Another question I'm frequently asked is, well, they're working above their target, their current grade, in this example shown, is 4 minus. How can their target still be a 3? Surely that's not a target if it's below where they're currently working. Well, that's why we've changed from, as this slide shows, target for good progress to good progress indicator. And what that really means is a grade three would be good for this student. The fact that they're working at four minus is excellent. It means they are surpassing that target. They're not working at the top 20%. Maybe they're in the top 5% or top 2% of students who have the same starting point as them. I think it would be unfair to keep moving that progress, good progress indicator because we wouldn't really know where we stand. I think this student is making excellent progress and it's to be celebrated. And I think it should be celebrated by parents as well. Um, the higher they get above that good progress indicator, the better they're doing. And we have lots of students who push themselves towards getting grade nine, who are two, three, sometimes four grades above their good progress indicator. I don't know any student who gets to their good progress indicator and says, yeah, that's plenty for me. Most students do strive to get their absolute best. So I think it is important that we have removed the word target from our terminology this year, because actually it's just about indicating what's good and it's, it's great to be better than good as well. And you can see uh, here targets versus results. Uh, this is actually from my class a few years ago. And you can see that when you look at real students, there's a full range. Student A, for example, has a target or an indicator of seven and they got a nine. There were two grades above their good progress indicator, which is fantastic progress. Some had a target or an indicator of seven and got an eight. That was excellent. Some hit their good progress indicator. Students G, H and I, they had an indicator of a six. They got that and that's good progress. That's still top 20%, remember. And the ones who are one grade below probably just about scraped average performance. Now, there would have been significant effort as we went through the school to avoid being average and to be above. But for those students, they have they're broadly in line with other people in the country. Now, we want to be above that. We want students to do as 
well as they possibly can. And I hope that the information just shows us in quite a clear format, a colour coded format if you like, whether we're on track to do that or not. And therefore we can have conversations about what can be done to support better progress if it's needed. So it's quite logical, parents often say, why don't we just move the targets up? If they're currently a four, why not just put five as their next target? Well, we want every student to achieve the absolute best they can. But if we keep moving it up, we don't really know who is performing better than their potential and who's not performing to their potential. So we like to keep those good progress indicators as a, a consistent benchmark as they go throughout the college. It does tell us what good looks like for um, similar students, but it very much is not a ceiling. It is something which they can surpass that indicator and make excellent progress. Um, and if we kept moving the targets and, and moving them up according to the current performance of the student, I think we would never really know where we are in terms of student performance. And we, it would be more difficult to say, yes, that actually represents excellent performance, or that performance is not as strong as it should be. So that's why the targets don't move up, even when current performance goes above uh, the indicator or the target. So you will get three reports per year. Year 7 is a little bit different because the first data capture on the 16th of November, that settling in data, as I described, scores from 1 to 4 in classwork, homework and behaviour for learning. There is a parents evening coming up on the 26th of November and I'll be talking about how to book, book appointments a little later. Your first full progress report looking at academic targets or indicators and current performance is on the 18th of January. And there'll be another report around the 26th of April looking at kind of an end of year or uh, end of year seven assessment point um, to give you an impression of whether they've met that end of year target or not. So in order to book appointments, you go to Edulink and go to Parents Evening and you'll see that there are slots for the relevant teachers uh, and you can simply book into those slots. If you have any trouble with uh, Edulink, then please do contact the ICT support team uh, at the school. Uh, the email address is smh at uplandcc.com and they can help you with any login, login issues that you are having. So once you've booked your appointment on Edulink, uh, teachers will then phone at an allotted time. We can't at this time have a face-to-face -face parents evening for obvious reasons and appointments will be about five minutes. So far we've had good feedback from our um, distanced parents evenings from both parents and staff and I think it's a good opportunity for you to speak to uh, teachers. I would recommend looking at settling in data and prioritising where there is any concerns, whether perhaps the classwork, the homework or the behaviour for learning falls below where, we, where you would want it to be and prioritise those for appointments. And finally, just to say thank you for uh, taking the time to listen to this presentation. Um, I know it's a huge amount of information and a lot of it is quite complex. As you go through, I, I think the key thing is that the assessment on Edulink, it's colour coded. It should give you a clear steer about whether things are going successfully or whether something uh, needs to happen differently. But if you do have any questions, either uh, technical or practical, please do email me and the address is on the screen and I'll get back to you um, as soon as I can. Um, I hope that Parents Evening coming up goes well um, and I hope that you find the information that we provide in terms of uh, progress and achievement in the college is useful to you. But I am also open to any feedback that you have and you can use the address on screen uh, to offer that feedback too. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day.